Hi, I'm Sammy, and I'm, I'm sort of your moderator for today's uh, talk. And uh, so welcome to everybody. The talk is called Reversing Climate Change Through Plant-Based Eating. So the, the bottom line message up front is that by, by each of us moving toward a plant-based diet, uh, it's good for the planet because it reverses deforestation and, um, and helps us create one of the best technologies for absorbing CO2 called trees. <laughs> um, your compassion towards animals by reducing the massive suffering that's going on in, um, in factory farming and your health by improving um, your wellness and your lifespan. So there'll be three talks each 20 minutes on these three topics. Uh, Fromm uh, will speak first as uh, the climate scientist in the group on the climate science of how plant-based eating uh, can mitigate um, our uh, climate issues. Lisa will then speak about animal liberation and the reduction of, hum of, of uh, animal suffering. And then Minika on the end will um, do human uh, health benefits when we adopt a plant-based diet. And after that, so that'll be a total of about an hour, um, and then there'll be a moderated discussion with the audience. So I will moderate and just you know, pick on people in some, some order. Uh, and so really that's the most important part for us anyway, is to engage and have a conversation about it with you. We're your neighbors in the area, right? And we're here to have a conversation about it. Um, just for flow, we appreciate if you'd hold your questions to the end. Um, we have pencil and paper there if you don't have some sort of writing device with you um, so that you don't forget your questions because they're very important to us. So I also want to kind of give you a good news message up front, which is the climate situation is not hopeless. Uh, and that the kinds of changes that we're going to be suggesting don't have you have to make radical changes overnight. Uh, you can choose to cut your meat intake in half every year, for example, over a long course of time so you don't have to go you know, immediately do something radically different. So we are hoping that you will choose to begin anywhere. Any small step towards reducing your meat intake will be helpful in all of the three ways that our speakers are going to talk about. So uh, with that, let me introduce uh, the first of our three speakers. Uh, Brom Ort will give his talk on climate science, uh, climate scientist perspective. So, good afternoon. My talk will be in three parts. First, I will mention my, my background in physics, and then talk about the climate system and global, okay, and global warming. Okay. And in the end, with a possible solution to the climate crisis. I studied physics in Leiden, in the Netherlands, and was fortunate to learn meteorology at MIT. In 1966, my wife, Bineke, and I immigrated to the US for a research position at the NOAA laboratory called GFDL, in, first in Washington, DC, and then in Princeton, New Jersey. At GFDL, the first computer models were developed to simulate the climate in the atmosphere and the oceans. I worked for 30 years at GFDL, my task was to describe the three-dimensional structure of the atmosphere and uh, to have a check on the model results which were developed at GFDL. To understand the global climate, it's helpful to look at the Earth as a whole. So, so here we have the Earth, indicated the red is the equator. As you can see, much of the Earth is, is blue. That's where the oceans are, 70%. Where 30% is taken up by the land. Now, the climate system is a complex system, but it is understandable. So we have, first of all, we have the atmosphere where we live in. It's about 20 kilometers thick, or 16 miles. Uh, it's a thin, 
as he paint on the earth, on this uh, balloon here. So it's very thin. And then we have the, the ice caps, the polar, the north and the south part. Of course, the land and the oceans, and then also the biosphere, which we are part of, which we are now also part of. All these elements depend on each other, and they exchange information with each other, energy and carbon dioxide and other parts. For the overall radiated balance, we have, first of all, we have the sun, which is giving the life on Earth. Without the sun, the Earth would be dead, dead planet. There would be no, no life. So we get most of the radiation comes around the equator and less near the poles. And we have the general circulation of the atmosphere, the oceans, which distribute the uh, energy more north and south. But to get the balance for the Earth that doesn't heat up, the Earth has to radiate out. It's not in the same part of the spectrum because we get the sun gives more the greenish uh, yeah. it's part of the spectrum, while the Earth radiated yeah. a much yeah. lower temperature. Yeah. At, um, so we get um, that this very low temperatures, but we have to, um, it has to radiate out. But it's in the infrared of the spectrum, so in a larger, larger area. And, um, but we have in the atmosphere, we have the gases, the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and um, CO2, and uh, water vapor is very important. But the, um, we need a certain amount of, of the greenhouse gases to, to absorb the radiation, because otherwise it would get too cold. But uh, we soon have too much. Unfortunately, now, nowadays, there's too much carbon dioxide, and the Earth is, is radiating out, it's getting too warm. So maybe on the next slide. We have here a curve from the carbon dioxide from about 1750 to recently 2023. So we can see, first of all, here it's going very, very slowly, but then suddenly it's starting to go up very quickly to 417, and now it's actually for, to more than 440 parts per million in carbon dioxide. Well, according to the estimates, maybe the safe limit would be 350 parts per million. Now, these measurements were taken actually by uh, taking, looking at the air bubbles in the Antarctic ice sheet, and they found there what the carbon dioxide is, so slowly was increasing. But the, these are direct measurements in Mauna Loa, it's on the uh, Hawaii. Um, you see that it's here a large increase. It's probably due to the uh, uh, to development of coal and gas and oil and usage of that. A significant effect occurred actually in about this time, 1988, that James Hansen from NASA presented to the U.S. Senate for the first time that the surface temperature was rising. And maybe we can have the next slide. This is the, first of all the carbon dioxide from 1958 to 1988. Um, the next slide. Here you see the temperatures that have been occurring from about 1880 to the last 100 years. This sort of cooling period, 
and here rising temperatures. But he was saying that uh, he thought that the temperature would be rising. But up to this point, there was a disagreement because some people said, okay, the ice age is coming, glaciation. The others say carbon dioxide will take over. Okay, so here we see the next slide, actually, where we see what is actually happening. And the seas have become warmer and warmer in the atmosphere. And as you notice now, that's really very, so that actually the f it's getting so warm that the Earth is going to be on fire. And we have seen that the many uh, fires have been going on <coughs> in Australia and in Canada, all around us. So in a way, it's some of the areas in the world are becoming more unlivable. Summer temperatures are so high that you can't live very well without air conditioning. Besides this item, there's also global warming. There are other planetary boundaries. You know, the extinction of wild animals and the loss in biodiversity of plants and animals. And this fresh water, this is polluting, and melting of ice and snow. The melting has been going on for a long time. In Europe, you have seen since the 1900s or so, it was already that the glaciers were getting lower. But um, it's very hard for people to accept that things are changing. <laughs> And then also what we have noticed here in our area, the more intense storms uh, and hurricanes, and also the mild weather that we have occurring now, is probably due to that the Arctic has been uh, lost much of its ice. So it is very much, that there's not such a cold temperature I mean, over there. So in New England, we may get more of these type of, of uh, of winters like we have now. Actually, at the same time that, um, that Jim Hansen gave, made his prediction, there was also the, um, the International um, World Meteorological Organization started to, um, to form an the international uh, program for, for climate change, the IPCC. And they gave actually, they described the, the situation in the world. They're probably the best evidence available here now for the climate. Um, seen a computer, <laughs> sort of. Uh, the, 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 according to the, um, to the IPCC report, there are two factors which are, which are happening in climate. First of all, the, the uh, uses of oil and gas, and then also the deforestation. And they say that actually deforestation is about the same magnitude as is the uh, use of fossil fuels. So let's go back to the original slide, maybe the, of the CO2. Okay, go back. So this has been actually during the Industrial Revolution. But if you look at the older records, it has been going on for a long time about 50 times as long goes out, goes out to the street, almost, I don't know. If you go to 10,000 years ago, and at that time already people started to, uh, to get the agriculture, the agriculture revolution. So from going from the uh, hunter-gatherers, we went to agriculture. And at, that, at that time already, a large amount of forest were cleared. Actually from the six trillion trees, 6 to the 10 to 12, 
only three are remaining now, three trillion. And it's, of course the trees were over, were cut down, the CO2 came in the air, but the air didn't keep it there. The, the, um, um, the atmospheric amount stays about the same. That is sort of interesting, because much of the energy apparently went into the oceans. The oceans would have collected the carbon dioxide for a large part. So we have had actually a very mild climate, but at a certain point it started to change. Um, actually, the de during the 10,000 years, the, the deserts have grown, and many of the wild animals have disappeared. But of course, during those thousand years, we have also generated pyramids, cathedrals, big cities developed music and art, and especially science and technology. In the, so actually what we have, uh, that there is actually an, um, yes, the persistent denial of the importance of deforestation. So we, um, there has been a problem in the, can I have the, the earlier one? Yes, yes one earlier before that. Okay, here's actually in the IPCC report, what they, so the fossil fuels, they take 100%, the whole is, but for the deforestation, we only take the net results. So actually, if you take the actual emissions, it's about three to four times more important than the fossil fuels. But it's very hard for people to change. They have now accepted that the fossil fuels are the most important thing. But there's not, um, the fossil fuels can reduce the amount, but still the states, the deforestation is so huge that that will overwhelm all the effects. So the most important things we can do is go to the uh, fossil fuel until we get the more, f building more forests in the air. So maybe we can go to the next slide. Yes. So this actually is an area, you can see if you take the land area, then we can see that there's two areas right here, the rocks and the, the uh, deserts, and here the snow and ice, and these are not being used. Why mo most of this area, forest and grazing land and cropland for for livestock, cropland for humans, you see that this area is, uh, takes up a large area. And much of the land is taken up by animals. So the cows and... Um, so to, for the grazing land. So in what we need in the future actually to change, to build more of the uh, areas by for forest, because the grazing land, the cows take up so much energy. And uh, we have now about, about um, these are what we talk about, it's about a, a million of uh, cows are slaughtered each day, actually, in the world. And as many goats and as many pigs, more pigs, and chickens, about 200 times a million per day. And um, they take up also, they also, a lot of livestock was taken up for the, uh, for the, for the animals. So if you start to, start to increase the area, take away some of the cows, then this will be reducing, maybe the next slide. So we can go to, to this area where you get more about half of the land is covered by, by, uh, by the trees, and there will be much less grazing land which is needed. And the livestock also, we need much more. And we could feed 
all the people which are on the earth. There would be no problem with defeating them. It's, um, but of course, the, the result is that we have to, to change our way of, of living. Instead, we have to change our way of eating. If you go to a plant-based diet, then, then many of the, uh, the global warming will probably be reduced because the trees are, will take up the carbon dioxide and also the um, um, uh, the, the, it will be both for the for the animal for people also to get more um, um, more health more health and benefits from because most of the diseases seem to be connected with meat the consumption of meat and especially dairy products also so if we could shift that there's a good uh, possibility for for improvement of the earth. So this is what we are planning to do with this plant meeting uh, in, uh, uh, initiative. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you for your courage and your interest uh, in what we have to say today. Um, my name is Lisa Burke, and uh, last winter I spent uh, in Lima, Peru. And I was living with a bunch of uh, el vegan elders in a household full of, uh, of, uh, of vegans. And, um, and I had the incredible opportunity to be introduced to some young uh, activists. And their main concentration was on uh, animal, um, animal liberation. I had, uh, I had gone down there to be exposed to uh, the lifestyle in terms of uh, having the opportunity to eat this, you know, the diet and to, to learn uh, about the correlations between animal agriculture and, and climate change. However, what turned me on or really changed my life was investigating and understanding and exposing myself to the incredible extent of uh, the destruction uh, through animal agriculture. and factory farming. It's just undeniable. There's nothing very good about it. And I, uh, from that point on, I, I became very co committed to uh, understanding it on a deeper level. And that's why I'm here today. Um, this is not, this is way out of my comfort zone. <laughs> uh, but I feel compelled to talk about it. I, I love the world. I love people. I love nature. And it's going fast. I don't want to be a, a, a naysayer, but it's, um, it's a pretty dire situation. And yet, I feel more clarity than I've ever felt in my entire life. Uh, so I'm just inviting you all to uh, sort of participate in what I've been through in the last year. I've only been vegan for a little over a year. Uh, and just to share with you kind of what, what uh, transpired uh, with me. So first slide. So this is a dreary slide. Uh, how many of you find that to be a bit dystopian? And uh, I just want to, you to know that I am not going to go any more gruesome than this. I am not going to expose you to pictures of the uh, industry, the inside of the industry, uh, just because that is up to each individual when you're ready to take a step and look at the many documentaries that are out there, uh, you can expose yourself to, to, some, to the horrors. You know, I, I don't know how to make it you know, sort of softer than that uh, about the industry, but this perfectly depicts actually a true reality because animal agriculture, uh, the trolling of the oceans, uh, the factory farming is, is a covert operation. And this is the this is the this is where we are at right, right now. <laughs> this is what we need to reverse. So that's as gruesome as it'll it'll get uh, for the time that you give me your attention. 
Next slide. So uh, animal agriculture is, um, I'm, are you aware that it is um, the leading cause of species extinction, ocean dead zones, water pollution, habitat destruction, global warming, worker exploitation, antibiotic overuse, and also the probability of another pandemic. And let's see, we can go to the next one. Um, the, 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 animal, the numbers, I, you know, I'm not a math person, uh, so the numbers are what are just so uh, mind-blowing around uh, the you know, animal agriculture. Uh, so I did this little thing with uh, perspectives on, on, on the numbers. So one million in seconds, I transferred them into seconds, is 12 days. So one million seconds is 12 days. One billion in seconds is 31 years. And one trillion in seconds is 31,688 years, which of course there was an ice age back then. That was before civilizations, any civilizations, you know. Uh, just so you know, that's in seconds. Um, according to the ASPCA, 10 billion land animals are slaughtered annually in the US. US animals in CAFOs, they're called, which are concentrated animal feeding operations produce an estimated 885 billion lots of manure a year, none of which is regulated by a government agency. A lot of stuff slips, slips away from our, our view. Uh, according to Aquatic Life Institute, we kill roughly 1 trillion to 2.8 trillion fish every year, whether for direct consumption, aqua farms, or those caught in the wild to feed the farmed fish we eat. That's where some of the complexities come in. All of these statistics are a study in themselves. This is just, I'm whipping through a very, very complex situation. According to FizzOrg, uh, in the United States alone, animal, animal agriculture guzzles 36 to 74 trillion gallons of water uh, per year. So, and despite its heavy environmental impact, animal agriculture is largely exempt from federal and state air and water pollution regulations that apply to other major industries. Next slide. So here we have an ocean trawler and the mouths of the largest nets are big enough to swallow a Boeing 747. They are capable of wiping out, you know, ancient um, reefs just within moments. They're, they're gobbling up huge swaths of, uh, of uh, whole, um, sorry, I know I'm not gonna come up with the word. Um, Reefs, yeah, whole reefs in, 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 just, in just moments. So you can imagine this is going on all over the globe, all the time. Uh, so does, can anyone guess what this is? Has anyone ever seen something like that before? Factory. Yes, what kind of factory? Fish factory. Good guess. It's, this is a CAFO, and this is, in, uh, this is in Hubei province in China, in the city. Uh, it's 26 stories high, windowless, windowless, and houses 600,000 animals, and they are pigs. They never see the light of day, and uh, they are they're in from this this building alone. They, there's 1.6 million that are slaughtered every year. Uh, so I have a computer queued up. This is the animal uh, calculator uh, to just. It's a little bit of a dirty trick, so I please forgive me for that because it's stunning. So from the moment that, that Sammy put this up here, th so it's now been three seconds, this is an animal slaughter uh, calculator, and there's already been over 300,000 wild fish caught, 300,000, 20, 30,000 chickens, farm fish, 
23,000, it goes like that. Uh, it's inconceivable what's going on all the time uh, so that we can feed ourselves uh, an un unnecessary protein source. So, uh, I guess I wrote this. Okay, I have to give it some. Animals that are caught in the industry are viewed as inert commodities, yet there is a life force and a will to live in every animal, and they fear death. There are many, many creative and torturous practices that are performed in the name of efficiency, increase yield, expediency, or supply and demand that any, any one of us would find really difficult to, to uh, it's just unpalatable. Can you hear me still? Yeah. So in the, in the dairy and chicken industry, the males are less valuable than females. I'm gonna start reading because I just can't, I can't keep it together if I don't. Um, in the large scale operations, the male baby chicks uh, are basically, they're sexed um, by the you know, thousands, if, mi just millions, they're sexed and then they are thrown directly into uh, grinders. That's, the, that's what happens, that's the fate of the males. Um, I don't know whether that's better than the fate of the females. Um, and in, in the dairy industry, uh, the, you know, veal, basically veal and uh, uh, some of the, some of the uh, beef is a byproduct of the dairy industry. So first comes dairy and then comes beef. Uh, so with the male uh, Holsteins, generally, because uh, they would be the males of the, of the best uh, dairy cows, they're taken within a day, sometimes two, uh, from their mothers. Their mothers are bellowing and unhappy, um, and they are put into confinement if they're male and left in there for either two or three weeks. 24 weeks would be the longest, uh, I think it's 24 weeks. Um, and it, you know, depending on what their meat is deemed for. So the milk-fed calves, um, they're called milk-fed, and they are deprived of iron, uh, iron-rich um, a milk supplement, and that is to make their, their uh, meat more valuable and more white and they are, are put in confinement, they don't move around, and in very, they're very, very young, they're still babies, and they are often um, so crippled that they can't even get up onto you know, the, uh, the, the trucks and the trailers to take them to the slaughterhouse. Um, so one of my main uh, sources for these, this talk was uh, a book entitled Animal Law, Welfare, Interests, and Rights, uh, authored by David S. Favre. Um, and I got it at the Vermont Law School <laughs> uh, bookstore. Um, so th these are some quotes from there. Agricultural animals are not companion animals. They share a different community with humans. While people may well decide to expend money on behalf of a pet well beyond its economic value, this will not normally be the case of agricultural animals who must exist almost entirely in the context of economic value. So the general public does not reject the concept of eating animal products and flesh, but they require basic uh, humane considerations for such animals. So can you change to the next? Um, I think it's supposed to be the storybook one. Oh, that one, okay, we can go back. Yeah, this one, please. The, right. Yeah, thanks. Um, The child storybook picture of family farms and happy animals, it no longer exists for the vast majority of farm animals. And that's important. It does exist here in you know, northern New England. Um, up until a year ago, I was buying happy meat and telling everyone about you know, the, the farm stand I, I, could, I, I went to. Um, so I, I don't have, you know, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm, I'm not quite a zealot yet. Um, I understand that we're all, you know, on the continuum of, un of learning and, and understanding, and we're all aware that we are in the, we are in a time of incredible change, and we're all looking for answers. So I am just giving you where I'm at. Um, I am no way, uh, you know, want to cast any aspersions on where anyone is right now on any of this. 
However, uh, so at last year, um, this is a this I got out of the law book, um, teaching students how to think about these things. So this this is a, a graph. This is human attitude, uh, intentional death, acceptable animal example, and action shapers. Um, and intentional animal abuse would be death accepted through dog and bull fighting, and uh, certain animal shapers would be the laws. So that's one end of the spectrum. Um, an uncaring use is death is accepted, battery cage, uh, eggs, and laws. So those are not happy, you know, those are not happy animals from a local farm. Ignorant use is death accepted, battery cage eggs, and well, oh, that's all one, I beg your pardon. Uh, respectful use is death accepted, no death, for f death accepted for free range chickens, and uh, sh action shapers would be habits. And I was in that camp a, year, a little over a year ago. Um, I certainly wouldn't be comfortable with the death of my pets other than you know putting them down when they were in, in need or whatever. And then um, the in the I, and then there were some ideas and information and ethics around that. And for me, I'm here. I just jumped in there. I can't imagine that I'm going to be going back uh, with what I know. That's no death by humans. Uh, death certainly maybe some wildlife. Uh, it happens. We observe it. And then personal ethics or religion. Uh, my hope is that. You know, humanity begins to go or continues to go in this direction and uh, does a bit of a deep dive into what is really going on. Um, so, next slide, which should be, yeah, that one. Um, most states' anti cruelty laws have a specific exemption for animal, uh, I'm in the way. Uh, for for anim agricultural practices, and the language extends to hogs, cattle, and other animals, as well as chickens. At the federal level in the United States, the Anif Anifal Wel Anifal Animal Welfare Act, AWA, specifically says that agricultural animals are exempt from its provisions, which shocked me. I had no idea. Um, so the responsibility for the enforcement of the AWA is also given to the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> That's the end of the quote. So there appears to be a bit of a, a conflict of interest there. Um, so you know, my hope is that the trend toward less tolerance for herding animals continues, and that we can kind of slow down the impact of factory farming so that Mother Earth has time to rest and to restore from so many years of abuse. Um, and then to rewild. She's very intelligent and she knows how to rewild. That, the, that is the most positive thing that I, I witness. I, that sometimes I go on to YouTubes and, and look at places being rewilded and it's just so heartening. Um, with this, you know, this is just a, a, a sort of a cliche question. You know, how, how do you decide who, who to eat? And how uh, how we are, are um, we are we are so um, acculturated with what we accept and what we don't in terms of, of what we eat. So um, this animal is highly intelligent, and you know, and and people do fall in love with their, with their pigs. Um, so it, you know, that that's a that's just a personal sort of uh, trick for the brain to ask everybody um, why do why we have that that uh, that bias when when we have uh, so much sentience in so many life forms. So um, next. So what is sentience? Again, this is from animal law. Dolphins measure up well against a fairly traditional set of criteria for personhood, and they should be recognized as members of the community of equals. They're in a very big group that should be recognized. In my humble opinion, I think all animals should be recognized. Um, 
there is a rough consensus that a person is a, is a being with a particular kind of sophisticated consciousness or inner world. A person is alive, a person is aware, a person feels positive and negative sensations, a person has emotions, a person has a sense of self, a person controls its own behavior, a person recognizes other persons, a person has a variety of sophisticated cognitive abilities. Next slide. Few species are more social than pigs. They form close bonds with each other and other species, including humans. And they recognize and remember up to 20 to 30 individuals. They have an elaborate courtship ritual, including a song between males and females. And the, the piglets you know, run to their, their particular mother's uh, uh, voice. Um, and she sings to them while, while nursing. Next. Researcher Lori Marino wrote in her paper entitled Thinking Chickens, a Review of Cognition, Emotion, and Behavior in the Domestic Chicken. Quote, my overall conclusion is that chickens are just as co cognitively, emotionally, and socially complex as most other birds and mammals in many areas, and that there is no a need for further non-invasive comparative behavioral research with chickens, as well as a reframing of current views about their intelligence. End of, end of quote. And next, a synopsis of Lars Chitka's The Mind of a Bee uh, says, bees have a remarkable co cognitive abilities. Sh and Chitka shows that they are profoundly smart, have distinct personalities, get that, can recognize flowers and human faces, exhibit basic emotions, count, use simple tools, solve problems, and learn by observing others. They may even possess, possess consciousness, end of quote. My belief is that we will be, continue to be incredibly astounded as the years go on, because science is delving into all of this. I am no longer surprised. I just want to protect. We live in, I mean, we live in just such a, we live in a paradise. And um, with, with, a, with a covert operation that is going on all the time behind the scenes, and it is protected by laws. You're not allowed to take photographs of um, any uh, of the uh, of, of operations in the animal industry. You can, I, I know people that have been arrested are trying to do so. Um, it, there's the incredible lobby in, in Washington to keep this away from the public's uh, eye and understanding. The practices are horrific. Um, and we're destroying, we're destroying this right on the heels of our deepening our understanding of how interconnected that we are. It, it's just, it's the most positive, fantastic uh, frontier that we're on the brink of. And I think that this is a real moment uh, for, for all of us. We can turn off that calculator now. So um, I know that we, I am like one voice in you know, this unprecedented cacophony of ideas and uh, information, and we're all trying to figure it out. I, if, if, I guess if I could leave you with anything today, uh, that would be you know, just an invitation to maybe observe animals today and give them their due. <laughs> Uh, is in their, their place in, in the natural world, understanding that every animal um, in, in a time of mass extinction um, plays its part. And that we can't extract ourselves from their perspective, from the perspective of a bee, <laughs> a highly intelligent, possibly sentient being, I would say sentient, you know, passes my criteria, uh, that, that it's, it's all critical. We have to do something uh, if we want our children to, in, or our grandchildren and so on, uh, to, to inherit a world that is as uh, vastly um, uh, capable of imparting the beauty from, from, from the natural world. So if you could just 
possibly do something like create your own Meatless Monday or uh, look at one of the documentaries or um, uh, see what you can do with a can of garbanzo beans. <laughs> you know, just take a baby step. Uh, and maybe some of you are, have already done so. Uh, and maybe some of you will take a step back. But I, I, I am very, very grateful that you've given me this time uh, to explore this and, and, and to be part of this imperative conversation that we have um, together. We don't have the answers. So it just happens that what's best for the earth and the climate also is best and very good for the animals when we have listened and we follow up, but it's also best for health, our own present health. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, research first. <clears throat> so the um, first person who really, really got a, got a handle on uh, whether there is a difference between eating uh, meat versus plants, um, was, um, let me just sort of <laughs> have to get switch over. I got so involved with listening to all of this that I have to really um, make a little, little shift here. Um, okay, so Colin Campbell. Colin Campbell in 1938 started, um, actually he came from a dairy family and was going to study uh, veterinarian studies, and then he switched quite soon. And uh, at Cornell, he studied uh, with a PhD in microbiology and in uh, nutrition. Um, and then he, with a colleague of him uh, at Cornell, who was Chinese, he became interested in, is there a difference in the outcome, whether we eat plant-based diet or meat? Uh, based diet. Uh, China is where he did all his research and it is perfect for that because in China there are huge areas where people happen to eat plant-based diet and other huge areas where they happen to eat meat and, and not so much dairy I think because many are lactose um, intolerant. So he did that in um, 170 villages they did that. A little bit in Taiwan, but mostly in China. Uh, and the outcome was they were especially interested in cancer and some other of these um, diseases. And the outcome was very clear. In those areas where bad people eat plant-based, there was much less disease especially cancer, but also heart disease and other diseases, than in the other areas where people eat um, meat and, and dairy. Well, dairy, not so much in China, especially meat. So this is Colin Campbell. <coughs> and he ran, his studies were called the China Studies. And it was very clear. That he did that for oh, decades. Huge, huge uh, outcome of this. And unfortunately, the meat industry um, provided nothing but pushbacks. And um, up till today, I think they are not really happy with this study. Um, but there is progress, and I'll talk about that too. Um, but first, I want to tell you where I, I was coming from. So. I came from a very medically, medically oriented <clears throat> family, generations of doctors. Uh, my grandfather was a, um, wrote all the, the books, the, the student study books on diseases. Uh, this is disease of the, of the stomach. Um, that's him. Here he's teaching. 
He's teaching, um, he is in Holland, and he was a, a professor in internal medicine. And here he is demonstrating to students with a patient in the bed what he was finding, and this is how he would teach some of the time. Um, he had, uh, uh, he made he, a quite famous speech in 1902, and he called the eubiotics the art of living happily and healthily and a uh, long life too. And in that, he singled, he singled out three items that people really need to do a lot less of. One was alcohol, drink less alcohol. Then it was smoking, smoke less. And then eat less meat. I really was surprised to find that. I, I have a copy of his speech, but that's what he felt, you know, he saw in his patients it was, you know, testimony of too much meat is really not healthy. Um, there is a lot of um, resources. One of the best resources we can have. It. Next slide is um, the Food Revolution Network. So this is John Robbins. Some of you may remember the ice cream factory of uh, Baskin and Robbins when Ram and I first into the, came into this country, that was, um, you know, that was sort of like uh, big for us. We lived in, in, in Cambridge and, you know, around the corner from Harvard, there was, a, there was an ice cream store and we were, they had 31 uh, different flavors, mm -hmm. a flavor for each day. Yeah. Um, I had myself, um, to go back a little bit in time, um, meat was always very expensive when I grew up in Holland. So I was never given the chance to overeat it. But um, when I came to this country, it was different. And Brahm and I, Brahm never liked meat very much, but I loved meat. I would have lunch meat for lunch and then some kind of meat or chicken for dinner. And that was fine until I hit um, the 40s, mid 40s, and I came down with a really nasty backache, and I didn't know what to do with that. I could, we were standing, we were staying with friends in um, at Squam Lake, who had changed their diet because of diabetes, and they had found out this uh, plant-based diet. Um, macrobiotic diet, and they said, why don't you start it this week and see what it does for you? And I'll tell you, we did, and I instantly noticed the difference. And not so much my backache disappearing all of a sudden, but it was more the energy. My energy at that point was just, you know, I didn't need any coffee in the morning, and I didn't have a slump after lunch, it was very even and strong and noticeably different. And my backache uh, also disappeared. So Brahm and I took a course in, um, for couples <laughs> in learning how to cook that way, and that is where we gave up eating meat. However, what we couldn't give up for the longest time, we come from Holland, from mm -hmm. Netherlands, which like Vermont is a dairy mm -hmm. country. We couldn't give up on cheese for the longest time, and yogurt. And until Brahm got a heart attack. And we thought, wow, where is that coming from? No meat, no, um, then no chicken, nothing. So we decided, okay, well, probably it's the dairy. So there we give up dairy. And it was not climate oriented at that point, our decision, because that was still under the radar as far as knowledge, even well, Brown may have known about it, but that. So we gave that up too, and that is how right now, since, since that time, we are totally plant-based. And this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. So John um, actually was supposed to go into the business of the ice cream business because his father was the only son, 
And he, uh, Mr. Baskin, died when he was in his mid-50s. Mm -hmm. And John said, uh-uh, there is something wrong here. And he decided to not go into that business at all, to a tremendous chagrin of his dad, I think. And he, with his wife and an ocean who was then a baby or a toddler, decided to live on a little island off the west coast of Canada and to go totally plant-based. Um, they even found a kale that was sort of thriving under the snow in the winter, I think. So they're an, an amazing, amazing resource. They, it's called the Food Revolution. So what they do is uh, once a year, twice a year, they invite a lot of uh, medical experts in the different diseases. And they um, invite them uh, to give an hour worth of uh, information about how to, um, how to cut down or avoid that. It is said that 70 to 80% of chronic diseases can be prevented or reversed, according to what I learned from there. So we're talking about heart disease, many forms of cancer, uh, diabetes, stroke, arthritis, cognitive decline, even Alzheimer, impotence, and much more. So um, Ocean gave, and, and John still, they're, in, they're very active in movies and, and this Food Revolution Network, which with all these uh, talks about, uh, about the diseases, and he came out with recently with a, um, a book called Real Foods, Superfoods. And this is what he has seen. He has seen that business goes on and on and on. And many people worry about these issues. Do we get enough protein? Well, the reality is yes, the protein actually deriving from vegetables seems to be much more easy easier to take up by the body and much more uh, healthy than the protein from meat products. Um, and then there's vitamins. People, yes, the only vitamin you have to eat is uh, separately uh, take pill or so it's B12. And then there's this horrible thing about antibiotics and it is, my father was also a doctor. All of, when I was young, he already warned us. He said, what is going to happen in the future, this overuse of antibiotics is going to make antibiotics much less, less effective. And 90% of, 80% of all that, uh, antibiotics is used on animals in the factory, factory style especially. Not good news. So, and what is happening also, people say, oh, you need extra protein, you need extra this and that, and so forth. And then they call it those superfoods. Well, Ocean Roman just came out with a book, Real Superfoods. And he says, real superfoods are greens, leafy greens, and more, um, mushrooms, legumes, Means be, you know, beans, berries, and other fruit, alliums, which is onions and, and leeks and so forth, sweet potatoes, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, tea and coffee. I was interested in the tea part. He mentioned also a lot of herbal teas that have really good, even medicine kind of type of effects. Uh, the there is uh, a lot of pushback from the animal industry, a lot of it, but there is also, um, there is progress. Can we have the next slide? Here is Eric Adams, who got himself a little bit in trouble right now because of another issue. But this is, he cured himself his diabetes with going plant-based. And um, he has, introduced in all of the city hospitals, actually. Um, and there are 12, I think, 
he introduced um, 11th public health and plant-based diet. The first choice, second choice, third choice is plant-based diet. And he's also trying very hard to introduce that in the school system. So in the yearly um, meeting that was, I think it was in the West Coast this year, of um, mayors, there were 1,400 people, and uh, they all vouched that they were going to introduce this and try very hard to introduce plant-based food wherever they can, school systems, maybe hospitals, wherever they can. Really good, um, good progress. Uh, because also, the amount of money paid in this country on Medic, uh, you know, for the health issue is stunning. I was just really stunned to hear it's four times as much as our military budget. And the military budget is the largest of its kind in the world. It's an amazing, an amazing industry and, and expensive. So there is good news uh, that this, this, these, are, these efforts are really are happening. And last but not least, um, I want to also mention um, that mindful eating, how we eat, what we eat, it all goes together. So there are, there's one of the things that I can, what I love doing is before I even put my fork or my spoon in my food, I look at it and I wonder where it is coming from. And all the hard work that it took to get it on my plate, where it's mostly now it's vegetables and fruits. Um, but still, it's a lot of hard work. And a lot of resources go into that. So we can have some contemplations. This food is a gift of the earth, the sky, numerous living beings, and much hard and loving work. May we eat with mindfulness and gratitude so as to be worthy to receive it. May we keep our compassion alive by eating in such a way that we reduce the suffering of living beings, stop contributing to climate change, and heal and preserve our precious planet. So we're very grateful that you came and that you gave us uh, your ears, and now we hope to have um, some feedback from you and some interesting and, and growth-inducing um, conversations together. Um, at the end, you can give, um, here is uh, resources, movies, a um, few websites, um, you can take that home, uh, and it's, some go back to 2017 or so, but it still goes on. Last month, there was a, a series which my son told about, my daughter, and that is um, just brand new. Um, it's a twin study. You are what you eat. It just came out on Netflix last month. Uh, and it's four, uh, four episodes, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's really, really uh, well done. It's, it doesn't show you just the research on these. So one of the twins would eat plant-based and the other would eat meat. Uh, and, and the first four weeks, it was provided. They would be sent and they just would have to open it up and maybe warm it up and eat it. And then the second four weeks, altogether was eight weeks they would have to um, start cooking themselves. And then, all along, there was a lot of medical kind of uh, scrutiny to see what was changing their blood and this and this, until the very end. Mm -hmm. and, and they made it so that these were all like a competition and they got very emotionally involved. It was a really fun movie. And at the end, guess who won the, the best health kind of uh, it was those who had been plant-based all along, not for those eight weeks. Yeah, so that's interesting. So that, that you can take home. Um, 
Is there anything else that we um, need to? I'm going to just add one more resource because um, I'm going home to it. Uh, Climatedealers.org has a, a, a VCOP convergence uh, that they do three times a uh, four times a year. It's happening this entire weekend, and it's at uh, it's at. Uh, you know, HTTPS, blah, 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 climatehealers.org slash VCOP. And that would be the site to go to. It, it has an incredible amount of uh, good speakers and uh, people that are um, involved in this change. It happens for the whole weekend. I have a question. We're going to transition into that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.